Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin with the great John Voigt. Thank you, sir. Mark, great to see you. It's a pleasure to see you. Well, unfortunately, your friend, Burt Reynolds, passed away. Yes. I remember both you in this unbelievable movie, Deliverance. Mm -hmm. What was he like? What can I say about this passionate fellow, my friend, Burt Reynolds? Burt was a uh, you know, he was a dynamo. He was, um, he was dangerous uh, to me and, and when I was making Deliverance. I was always a little bit afraid if I had to get in the car with him because he was a stuntman, you know. And uh, uh, he always took us right to the edge, you know. And in some way he lived his life like that a little bit. We, but he was a wonderful guy to be around. He was such a joy. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just talk to him a second. Bert, you know, I know you're... Uh, you were such a wonderful, you're a true artist in every way. You have a, the greatest love for your craft, for your fellow peers. And, uh, you know, you and I had a, a wonderful relationship. We had the greatest times, very good talks. And, uh, and we're going to miss your handsome face around. Uh, and... Uh, and I know you're with your buddies. You're with uh, Sammy Davis. You're with uh, Dom DeLuise. You're with all these great guys. Johnny Carson. All your friends are going to meet you. And, uh, you know, I, I keep an eye on all these lovely ladies in heaven, will you? God bless you. Rest in peace, kid. Any story or stories? Oh, yeah. Well, I, Bert was, uh, he, he was a, a scalawag, you know. I, I th we were talking about... Um, this word, pantheon, you know, the, the gods of our industry. Well, he was one of those guys. And the person and the figure that you put up there is, is the, uh, the bandit, you know. He, no one ever created a character like, quite like that. We all fell in love with the bandit. And he was a lot like that guy. Uh, he was always teasing me. When we were doing deliverance, I'll tell this one little story. We were going into areas that n not a human being had walked for a long time. And, you know, getting to our canoes. And sometimes we'd go down cliffs and stuff, you know, and getting there early in the morning, this whole crew. And I remember one day we were going down this cliff face and on a, you know, on a rope, about 35 feet or something like that. And uh, everybody else was coming down. They were dropping the, the uh, camera down this area. And I looked up, and then I see four chairs being dropped down for the actors. <laughs> so, we didn't, so all of this virility went, went out the window, you see. They're going to take care of us like Hollywood. Now, we were sitting on rocks and, and, and uh, you know, stumps and stuff like that by the river with our feet in the water. And yet we had these chairs. Hollywood was still there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they put the chairs up. No one sat in them except Bert. Bert sat in my chair. And uh, he sat there, and, uh, you know, a couple of days in a row. Then it became four. And I, I go, what the heck is he doing sitting? And, and, and I was saying to myself, now, John, what are you upset, upset about? It, every, this chair is for anybody. We're sitting here on rocks. We don't need the chairs, you know. And I went through all this stuff, you know. He couldn't figure out what he was doing. And finally, at, after 10 days, I said to him, Bert, can I ask you a question? And he says, sitting in my chair, he said, oh, I, of course, John. What is it? And I said, you know, we've been here. We don't need anything. We're in the woods. We're having a, this adventure. And, uh, and yet, the chairs come down. And you sit in my chair every day. You've done it for 10 days. He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, well, John, it's quite simple. When I sit in your chair, I can see my name on my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and he was waiting 10 days for me to say that, to bring it up. He had that joke in his pocket. But anyway, he was like, he was like that. He was such a delight. And uh, Did you keep up with him? Yes, I, we, were, we, were, we were close. I, I, I called him, you know, every, every month or so. Let me ask you a question. I don't know if people know this, I think many do, mm -hmm. but I've noticed you have quite an affinity towards the state of Israel. It's almost central yeah. to your life. Why is that? 
Well, th this began, this, this story has a beginning. My father was a golf prof professional in Scarsdale, New York. He had three boys. We were one year apart. The reason why he had this job at Sunningdale Country Club was because these Jewish people, it was a Jewish club, German Jews, they came to this country, wanted to play golf, wanted to join one of the clubs, and w weren't allowed in the clubs. So, uh, so, you know, they didn't complain. They went around raising the money to buy land, and they built the club. And because of their ingenuity and because of their flexibility and vision, my dad had this job. So I knew at a very early age the insanity of uh, anti-Semitism. I remember when I, in the 40s, I was born in 1938, in the 40s, I remember seeing a Life magazine picture of a little boy behind barbed wire. And I, I identified with that boy. I said, that could be me. What are they doing to these people? And for, oh, that stayed with me all my life. So I've felt a real responsibility in a certain sense to stand up against anti-Semitism, right? And in that journey, I've gotten very close to the Jewish people. Now, there's another aspect to it. And that is my father. My father was a very poor boy. He was uh, eight years old when he caddied at this country club. And uh, he was a very cute kid. He had white blonde hair. They used to call him Whitey. And uh, he, he would tell the story on himself. He, he, was, he was a charming man, my dad, and had a great sense of humor. And, he, and he'd tell us the story. He said, uh, you know, how he would caddy at eight years old. He was making more money than his dad was, taking care of his family. Uh, and uh, three, three siblings. And uh, at the 16th hole, he would say, you know, he would, and he would, he had this wonderful way of, <laughs> he was a good actor, my dad, in some ways, although if you put a camera on him, he, 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 went, uh, he, he became nervous and did other things, but he had this way of being, you know. And he said, the 16th hole, this little boy would say, you know, it's my birthday today. <laughs> oh, Whitey, is it? And then we'd reach in that pocket at the end of the day and give him a little extra money. And this was important to him, you know. And one day he said that, it's my birthday today, and the man said to him, Whitey, wasn't your birthday three weeks ago? So he was caught, see. But, uh, but they didn't care. They understood what he was doing, and even admired his, his chutzpah for a little kid, you know. And, uh, and they, they kind of embraced this young man, and they taught him many things. My father, this happened later on in my life, I realized that my father had been, uh, when he was instructing somebody else, I found out some of the things that he was given as instruction by these memberships, see, by this membership of the club. He, they would give him words to say at the beginning of the day. Here's three words, Whitey, and at the end of the day, I want you to come back and put them in a sentence or something like that, right? Just improving his, his uh, vocabulary. How old was he when he started? Well, nine, ten, eight, nine, nine ten, eleven, you know, all the way up. And uh, he, he was fastened to this club. They taught him how to uh, behave at the table, different things, manners and things like that, you know. As I realized, as, as I got older, I said, Hmm, that's pretty interesting. And it, it occurred to me when I was 14, I had a kind of an epiphany. My father, who as I have said, he's, he was an extraordinary fellow, very charming man, very poised, full of fun, loved children, was a great father, great storyteller, and uh, very principled guy too. Very st strong m morals, you know. But not, never rigid, playful, but strong when he needed to be. Everybody admired this guy. And when he was 16, this membership made him a pro at the club, one of the pros. When he was 18, they made him the head pro of, of Sunningdale Country Club. 
a position which he's held till his passing when he was 63 years old. And it occurred to me when I was 14, I said, you know something? I compared him to his siblings, two sisters and a brother. They were nothing like him. Uh, he was so superior in every way, not to demean them, they were very nice people. But they just didn't have the same qualities he had and the grace that he had. And I said to myself, you know something? My dad was raised in the Jewish culture. That's who he is. So, and this has stuck with you. Oh, it was, it's very moving when I talk about it. Yeah. And, uh, and so this idea, uh, you know, it, it stayed with me. And my friends have been uh, extraordinary Jewish people all through my life. But I, and, and then I went through a crisis at a certain time in my life, and I was looking at all religions, and I was raised Catholic, and I have a great regard for the Catholic Church. And uh, what, what it gave me and the teachings that, uh, and the schools that they have today are very good. They're on another level in the public schools. And, uh, you know, the hospitals and all of this. And the, and the great people, you know, John Paul II, uh, whose part I played at one point, and, and Mother Teresa is one of my heroes. So I have great regard for the Catholic Church. But I, I, I did a lot of investigating of all religions, and I came to understand much of the Jewish history. There's a wonderful book by Paul Johnson, uh, History of the Jews. It's a great book, folks. Great and and, and you, Paul you Johnson is a great man. Eyes. What's that? You have tears in your eyes. Well, the, I, think, I think righteousness uh, brings emotion out of me. I, I, I think people who, have, uh, who seek truth uh, are those who I would, um, uh, you know, seek to follow. I hope, hope I, I, I'm thought of one of those at the end of my days. But uh, anyway, there's so many great people. And, and, uh, and so I've looked at this history of the Jewish people. And at one point I said, the greatest wonder of the world is Jewish literature. With all the different, you know, the, the rabbis, the great Einsteins of the Jewish people uh, across the years were rabbis. They made commentary on this Bible that they had. We have just coming up almost at the present time with the Hasidic people when there was a need for something else in the Jewish world. When people were, uh, w the people in Europe, this part of Central Europe, were, um, were bereft of, uh, of the ability to, to read all this literature, then this fellow came along called the Baal Shem Tov and he taught them songs. He said, you, you, you simply need to be you know, happy in your work you follow this, follow this, behave in a certain way, and here's some songs to remind you of, of, of the truths of things. And, and uh, so right up to the present. And that's why I came to the, the Jewish, the Baal Shem Tov began a legacy that wound up in my backyard in, in, in California, uh, the Chabad, and, the, and, and I made friends with these, with these fellows. And they're a fun group, really lots of fun. And, and they help people. And I've danced on their telethon, danced the Hasidic dance with the Hasidic and it became quite a deal. So anyway, I've, that's, that's my story with the, my affection. Well, it's for very Jewish fascinating. People. And it explains why you go to Israel, why you do what you do. And when we come back, John Voigt, I want to ask you another question. You used to be a liberal. How did where, you become did a little... You, oh, yeah. find that out? I found that out. <laughs> and then you became a conservative. Yes. I want to know how you became one and then how you became another. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, each week you can watch me on Levin TV most of the week. Go to crtv.com slash mark and sign up and join us. crtv.com slash mark or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. We'll be right back. John Voigt, you've never kept your politics quiet. You used to be a liberal, <laughs> a right. loud, active liberal. Before I get to how you became a conservative, how did you come to liberalism? Well, I, 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 it was a very destructive time in the 60s, I was just out of school. And uh, I mean, th think of the mantra of the 60s for the young people, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. 
What a recipe for chaos, you know. R really destructive time in many ways. And uh, all of this energy from the youth, you know, uh, was going, was, I, I believe that there were forces at work at that time that were uh, from the left. That means, you know, Karl Marx, communism, progressivism, which was a word that the, they invented to hide their communism for a while, and that stuck, and, and uh, so socialism. Th these forces, many forces invaded that decade, uh, taking advantage of this disruption with the assassination of John Kennedy. We were in trauma. The country was in trauma, and then we had at the end, at 1968, we had the deaths of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Great people that we cared a great deal for. So in that time, there were people who, the, the Vietnam War erupted in that time. And there were many, um, many folks on, uh, on the, uh, against that war that were charismatic people, people from our industry. And as I was auditioning to get in this industry and working hard to become an actor, I fell in with that group of people and I was swept away with the propaganda. And one of the pieces of propaganda that I bought at that time, and when, and, and when you're involved in propaganda, I have to say, uh, there are no doors out of it in a certain sense because if your friends are there, this and that, and you make associations and you, and you pass these sound bites back and forth and all of this. So I understand what's going on in Hollywood today. I understand it. I was right there, you know. And, uh, and those people are focused on their work too. They're trying to just get a job. So it's convenient for them to be, you know, politically aligned too. So I was one of those guys, and uh, I believed what, what I had been ingesting. And one of the things was that the war in Vietnam was really our problem. That if we removed ourselves from it, that the south of Vietnam and the north of Vietnam, the communists under Ho Chi Minh, would come together and embrace as brothers, as family. And I, I bought some of that. And I was in the streets, you know, against the war and that stuff. And then what happened? Then the people in the streets, and by the way, you know, we never lost, our, our military never lost a battle in that war. And we were on the, on, on the way to the defeat of the North. But the real energy that closed out that possibility was those people in the street and they certainly weren't the majority of Americans but they were very effective it's like what's going on now they have a march they've prepared an army of people to go out and, and speak and make noise and and you would think if you were watching television this must be the American people but it isn't but anyway <clears throat> and they brought down the war it came to a close and we pulled out of Vietnam we pulled out of Vietnam, and what happened? Was there this embrace? Was there this celebration? No. Two and a half million people were murdered in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam because of our absence. And that, and what happened with the left when they saw that? It's, it's, it's uh, the signature of the left. They create this, you know, this chaos and horror and they walk away. They take no responsibility for it. That's what happened to all my buddies. Mm -hmm. They celebrated. We won, the, we won the war. We won it. We won our war. And, I, and there was this bloodbath. And I remember Joan Baez had a little piece in the paper. And it was the only single voice from all of the left. And she was ridiculed for it or put aside for it. And I said, and I thought to myself, she's right. And we were wrong. That's the turning point. That was the turning point. And it took a long time because propaganda is dangerous. It gets into our system. It's reinforcing. Yes. It, it is, and 
And it took me a long while to pull completely out of it, but little by little I did. And then I saw that the answer, much like Reagan, when he said, you know, the Democratic Party, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. Well, to some degree, I have to say, the same thing happened to me or anybody who was a conservative now and was at that time on the other side. Because when you look at, let's say, John Kennedy's inaugural address, his inaugural address would be deemed today by the people who were in Hollywood and my friends in Hollywood and the people over the country who are on the left as some radical nut from, from the Republican Party. We simply have lost something in the, along the way, but it hasn't been our own fault. We've been attacked by an insidious and, and I would say, evil force. Uh, um, and I've traced that, and I know a little bit about it. Uh, so I, I know how, I know what the battle is. The battle has been raging, and it's and it's reemerged in the, in this century, uh, in full force. And that's what we're dealing with right now. When we come back, I want to ask you about this conservatism. Yeah, you're a Republican. Mm -hmm. You were a very early supporter of the current president, Donald Trump. You bet. And I want to know what you saw that triggered you to be such an early supporter. We'll be right back. So, John Voigt, the Vietnam War had a big impact on you. You went from being a leftist, basically, to a conservative, to a Trump supporter. Right? Eventually, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you, well, you know, just going back to that moment, you know, in time, I look back on that uh, moment when I realized that we were responsible for all that, that uh, bloodshed, that the people in the streets really had that kind of power. And, uh, and I feel, and I've said this to people, I've said, I have blood on my hands from that. I understand. I was... That, that was a moment in time when I was out of line and I had to make up so much, you know. And I feel that, you know, I feel that way. Um, it's, uh, so I'm not going back to that. And, uh, and today, I, uh, you know, I, I've come a long way and I've had a lot of fun, I must say, you know. Uh, one, of the th one of the great joys of my life is my relationship to the military. And uh, patriotism is, is a very, brings you many beautiful friends, very close to the first responders of 9-11. And uh, I, um, so I'm, I'm a person at peace. So when people come at me from my own area of the world and uh, say those things that maybe I would have said way back, I understand them completely. I feel sorry, I feel sad for them and sad for us. And I, I know that we have to keep uh, focus and keep, you know, keep battling for what is true. And, and this is a, and, and things will change because the truth will prevail. So how did you become a uh, early Trump supporter? What did you see in candidate Trump? Yeah, well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, there were 17 guys with him, right? They were all very top fellows, bright, very bright fellows, very capable. And I don't know if there's ever been such a, a legion of very, very good righteous folks on this one stage together. But I looked at the world and what was left uh, after the past years, and the world was in chaos. Terrorism had swept across the world. Uh, there were, because the cat was away, the, the big cat of the United States had been sidelined, the rats were at play. And so you had North Korea making these gestures up to endanger their neighbors. You had Iran sponsoring terrorism across the globe 
with Hezbollah and Hamas and their other, and, and, and we had this situation in Syria where we watched without responding to 500,000 people being murdered in Syria. So it was this, you needed someone who had tremendous uh, strength and, uh, and someone who could see clearly now what, what the damage was that was going on and what had to be addressed. And you needed somebody who was a doer, somebody who solved problems, who got up in the morning to solve problems, right? And many of them at that stage were like that. And then on the, the, the home front, we had, a, we had terrible uh, joblessness, a, a failing economy, uh, a, a civil war really, too. So much going on. So I'm looking. I'm like a casting director in a film. I'm looking. Uh, who's the guy that could handle this? Right? And as I watched and I saw what Donald Trump was pointing to and the courage, maybe not courage, just clarity, this immigration situation which had to be addressed and it wasn't addressed for years. And by the way, every, all this tumult that they're trying to create, if you listen to Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, they said the same things about immigration. He's getting blamed. They're trying to make him a racist for saying the exact same things, right? But, he, but the difference with Donald Trump and those folks, he's going to do something about it. And as I saw, as I saw him, you know, focusing on like the, just the clear common sense of our trade deals and our dealings with it, he said, we're going to have politicians sitting down with these people negotiating treaties. This was a, you know, an eye opener for me because, yeah, of course they don't, they've negotiated nothing. You know, they beg for money, but they haven't negotiated anything. They're not tough negotiators. They're not card players. They don't see what's going on on the other side of the table. That kind of thing, right? So I know, yeah, that's right. You have in China, you have these chess players, the very best chess players in the world, ready to make deals that would affect 100 years hence. I mean, you've got real big guys up there. You better have the right people on, at, at the other side of the table. All these things, they made sense to me. Do you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and the, more, the more he talked, the more I saw what was going on. And the other thing, that, there are two other things. One was he was happy in, in a battle. Somebody came at him, he was happy to respond in kind. It took no energy from him. And we had seen, you know, we had seen the attacks against George Bush, Mitt Romney, Sarah Palin, all of these lies and slanders that covered them and defeated them in the end. Now, when we come back, I want your second point. You said there's two points. Yeah, there's two points. All right, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, check us out at Levin TV. Go to CRTV.com slash Mark, CRTV.com slash Mark, or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. We'd love to have you join us over there. We'll be right back. So you supported... Donald Trump early, John Voight. Yep. You said there's two reasons. One, you like the fact that he had clarity and he fought. Right. Fought back. What was the second reason? Well, there's a, there's a, there were several things in there, but uh, the, one of the things that, that made him, separated him from, from all the rest, was the fact that he had enough money to, to run his campaign. And he didn't have to seek huge amounts of funds for his re-election to keep somebody in his pocket so he could always have that cash to run on. Now this area is a very tough one for, for people who are in politics. It's a, it's, it should be looked at, it should be repaired because uh, it's a, 
it's gone way beyond what it should you know, the amount of money that these that even local politicians have to raise is out of line now you like that he was self-funding he was self-funding and and that meant that he wouldn't have anybody that he had to uh you know uh, that was that he had to appeal to in his decisions which would have to be very strong and tough decisions somebody had to be he had to be, have a lot of courage well he certainly seemed to have a lot of courage and he didn't have that other thing so he all of these people have to they have i can see in the decisions i know some of these people some of these politicians good guys who are beholding to you know some of the people that they've uh, connected to to run their campaigns and they're bending in those in their uh, you know in support or non supporter this or that the decisions are being swayed by by this relationship he didn't have it what what do you make of the virulence of the attacks against him is this the old left that you that you left in the media now and well, it certainly it? is the left uh, doing it uh, and the virulence is because he's effective that's that's what the virulence comes from he's actually doing what he said he would do it's an amazing thing in itself isn't it but he's actually accomplishing returning to our basic principles of government that were given to us by those guys on the wall there right he's accomplishing it and there in disarray he's one by one picking out the stuff that the weeds and they are the weeds and so this is their dying breath they have to they have to stop him somehow so you see these very extraordinary things that they come up with that's what they do they conjuring lies and slanders against this man trying to to destroy this presidency it's that simple when you talk to me like this and it's going to be seen all over the country, including way back in Hollywood. Do people come up to you and say, John, what's, what's going on? John, uh, you're going to hurt your career. Or is it, we expect this from John Voight. It's well known now that he's a, well, that's an true. outspoken patriot, conservative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you get a little of everything, of course. You also get guys that come up to you and say, hey, Johnny, great, keep going, will you? Other actors? Yes, other actors, you know. People in the business, yeah, I, I get a lot of support from people I I appreciate, who's who I respect. So, it's it's not all one way. And also, yeah. you know, I like my peers. I like them. We're in the same industry. I understand them. But do they like you? Well, it's not so important to me. You see <laughs> what I mean? That's not important to me. Yeah. I mean, it may it may be important to me if I require, you know. Um, work <laughs> uh, but there's enough people around who are of a conservative nature uh, but uh, but hollywood has been inf infiltrated why because they're important that's why the left is focused on hollywood that's why they focused on our universities and that's why you know and if you can look at the that uh, subculture of the left they know exactly what they're doing you know they've organized you know, and, and been very effective. So we have a big job on our hands mm -hmm. because our children are not being raised to appreciate our great, the, the greatness of our country, the greatness of our f founding, you know, principles. And thank God for Mark Levin. He is the, the watchman over this treasure and the, a person who can, can explain the beauty of it and knows exactly what has the, where the attacks have chipped away at it too because we have to get all that back you're very kind we'll be right back so john voigt your early supporter of donald trump how's he doing i met someone on the plane flying to to, to make this appointment with you a friend of mine is conservative, a woman, uh, actress, very good one. And I said, so what do you think about our man? And she just did this. That was a, that's, 
That's me crying. <laughs> it was her. Two. Why are you crying? Saying, because. It's so, first, first of all, the gesture was so beautiful. She couldn't even speak. She was just saying, thank God. And I say, thank God. And one of the reasons why I can say thank God is because I, I, I know he's there, you know, for us all. God. And that's one of the things that we've lost is this compass of God. We have... What did Karl Marx come up with? He eliminated God from the picture. So we can do it without this. Mm -hmm. Not these boys. Not our guys. You know, they knew very well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by our Creator, that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And by the way, one of the things that I know you know the genius of the architecture of our founding, this Constitution, where it came from, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration. I'm lost in the thought of you being the one that I'm sitting in front of now. No, no, no. You understand yeah. this, the genius of them to say the pursuit of happiness. Because if you go into a communist country, as I did, in 1991, I went to Moscow to make a little film, first time. It was during Glasnost, Perestroika being the time that they were changing things, of more openness, you know, and all of this stuff. So I was there. And what did I see? I said, people with their heads down would not look you in the eye. In the hotel, nothing worked. You go to the desk to ask for something, a light bulb changed. They wouldn't look at you, pretended they didn't speak English, all of this. And these people, deep unhappiness, they had no possibility to pursue happiness. And that's the difference. That's what, that's what socialism, communism, progressive, that's what it means. You don't have the ability to pursue happiness. You can't raise yourself in, in, up above anyone else. As soon as you get more than the next guy, you slap down. So no matter how hard you work, you can't improve the lot for your children. It, it's, they're unhappy. Their buildings are unhappy. There's nothing happy about their societies. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's a mark. And that's the genius of our... This happiness is a big thing. Anyway. I have never heard it put that way. Truly, beautifully, beautifully put. We'll be right back. So John Voigt, your early supporter of Donald Trump. How's he doing? I met someone on the plane flying... To, to, to make this appointment with you. A friend of mine is conservative, a woman, uh, actress, very good one. And I said, so what do you think about our man? And she just did this. That was a, that's, that's me crying. <laughs> it was her. Two. Why are you crying? saying, because it's so, first, first of all, the gesture was so beautiful. She couldn't even speak. She was just saying, thank God. And I say, thank God. And one of the reasons why I can say thank God is because I, I, I know he's there, you know, for us all. God. And that's one of the things that we've lost is this compass of God. We have, what did Karl Marx come up with? He eliminated God from the picture. So we can do it without this. Mm -hmm. Not these boys, not our guys. You know, they knew very well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by our creator, that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And by the way, one of the things that I know you know the genius of the architecture of our founding, this Constitution, where it came from, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration. I'm lost in the thought of you being the one that I'm sitting in front of now. No, no, no. You understand yeah. this, the genius of them to say the pursuit of happiness, 
Because if you go into a communist country, as I did, in 1991, I went to Moscow to make a little film, first time. It was during Glasnost, Perestroika, being the time that they were changing things, of more openness, you know, and all of this stuff. So I was there. And what did I see? I said, people with their heads down would not look you in the eye. In the hotel, nothing worked. You go to the desk to ask for something, a light bulb changed, they wouldn't look at you, pretended they didn't speak English, all of this. And these people, deep unhappiness, they had no possibility to pursue happiness. And that's the difference. That's what, that's what socialism, communism, progressive, that's what it means. You don't have the ability to pursue happiness. You can't raise yourself in, in, up above anyone else. As soon as you get more than the next guy, you slap down. So no matter how hard you work, you can't improve the lot for your children. It, it's, they're unhappy. Their buildings are unhappy. There's nothing happy about their societies. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's a mark. And that's the genius of our... This happiness is a big thing. Anyway. I have never heard it put that way. Truly. Beautifully, beautifully put. We'll be right back.